Well, Low Crossing Church, how are you? Is everybody doing okay? Man, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to see all your smiling faces. This has been quite the series, uh, and it's been a challenging one. And, uh, you know, and I, I, I've looked out, and I've watched numbers, and how many people are coming, you know. And after the very first uh, sermon, I was talking to Clayton, the, the campus pastor at the Macomb campus, and I said, you know what, these are hard truths, and they're going to be hard for some people to accept. And, you know, some people that you know, are, are saying, well, that doesn't really apply to me, and I'm just not going to come to that. And, and uh, there's, there's a, there was a lot of angst in that, but I'll tell you, this stuff's important. It's important. It hits us right where we live, and uh, we need to really take this stuff in our hearts. You know, and even if there are people that say, you know what, uh, th- those truths are hard to hear, and I'll just wait till they get to the next series. Listen, we have to be people who tell the truth and t- speak it in love, and that it needs to motivate us to change. Because, I mean, good grief, why are we here if we don't want to be better than who, the, the person that walked in when we walked back out, right? And I'm just hoping that for all of our campuses. I'm, I'm hoping that for everybody in Kirksville and in Macomb at 929, Hannibal, Pittsfield, and uh, Lima, you know, coming on board. It's really neat to see what's going on there. God's doing great things. He's doing awesome things. But, you know, if you look at, like, church buildings and you look at programming and you look at all that, that's great. But what he really needs to do is something in your heart. He needs to do something in my heart. That is where change really happens. It's not about what a building looks like or a program looks like. It's about what you look like and whether or not you're reflecting the image of Jesus Christ. And, you know, that's what I really, really want. You know, this last sermon in the series isn't going to be man up, it's man down. And uh, the reason that I want to say that is because I think there are certain things in life, and I'm going to say this, you know, I'm going to speak directly to guys, but this is going to affect all the ladies in the room too. There are certain things that just take us out. And uh, I want to explore those things. Biblically, those are very well defined, and I want us to, to read those together. I want us to take those into our hearts together and then let God change us together, okay? So where we're going to begin is in 1 John chapter 2 because uh, John actually addresses these three big areas in this passage. And it's interesting how he begins. I I never really put this together before, but in 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 14, he says this. He's talking to men. He says, I write to you fathers because you have known him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. I mean, if you just stop right there for a second, those are very encouraging words. Guys, these are very encouraging words. Whether you're a young man or whether you're a father, the the Apostle John's really trying to encourage you. But if you look at the very next verse, I want you to see what he says. And you know, there's a there's a a paragraph between these two, but I wonder if they need to be there. That paragraph space needs to be there. He says this in 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So he encourages both young men and more mature men, fathers and young men, and then he says, you don't want, we don't want you to be worldly. We don't want you to be in the world. We don't want that world to be to be overcoming you, and then he defines what that is. And I want you to understand that even though this applies to all of us, he has spoken directly to men, right? Fathers and young men, just before that. Now look what he says in 16. He identifies what it means to be worldly. So, you know, it's one thing to say, hey, you're worldly, or don't be of the world. What do you mean when you say that? He's going to explain it. For everything in the world... The cravings of the sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. Those are the three bigs. Those three big ones that he just mentioned there. The first one has to do with the cravings of the flesh. Another word for that, a four-letter word for that, is lust. How we've all heard some guys, haven't we? If you've not gone to church very long... You've heard one on that. You've heard one on lust, right? The second one uh, is going to be about greed, 
materialism, and you've probably heard a sermon on that. And the third one is going to be pride, and you've probably heard a sermon on that. And so you're going, okay, you know, I've done this before. Put it on autopilot. Here's what you haven't heard. I don't think you've ever heard it because I personally never thought of it before. And it doesn't mean that I have to say it for you to have heard it. But it was like, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Because all my life in ministry, and even before I was in ministry, when I was just a Christian, I heard about how terrible these things were. And it wasn't until I was reading and diving down into this scripture that I got a completely new understanding. And, when, and I need for you to hear me out, okay? Because when I first say what I'm going to say in a little bit, it's going to shock you. And you're going to go, what did he just say? But I want you to hear me out because there's something profound. And, and I don't like you know, taking credit for anything being profound, but I really believe that God gave this one to me, okay? Listen to this. Lust. That's trap number one. Lust. As you view that, what I need for you to understand is that lust in and of itself is absolutely normal. Guys, it is absolutely normal. You have nothing to apologize about if you deal with lust. More than that, listen, it's God-given. God created you with that. It's instinctive. You're hardwired for it. See what I said a little while ago? You're going, what? I never heard, didn't hear that one before. Right? I'm, that's supposed to be bad. Lust is bad. No, it's not. No, it's not. Lust is instinctive. It's part of how God created us to be. The problem is there is a spiritual quality that defines that. There's a spiritual quality that completes this concept. And that is intimacy. Spiritual intimacy. It completes that. Now, here's the problem. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, it talks about something that happened to all mankind. Male, female, doesn't matter. I'm going to read verse 2, 1, and then 4 and 5. And it'll explain what actually happened. Listen to what it says. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Okay, you've probably heard that before. Something inside me died. What was that? What died? You were dead. I'm obviously not dead, so, but some part of me, some aspect of me died. What, what is it? And then if you go down to verse 4, it says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Go back... Uh, uh, did I read four and five? Yes, okay, I did both those. All right. So something inside me died. What was it? It was, it was the spiritual reality that defined or gave meaning, meaning to the instinct. So like I was split in half when whatever it was that died inside of me, I was ripped in two, okay? What is it that died? It was the spirit of God that he placed inside of man. Sin came into man and he died. What died? His spirit died. He, that part of him that was of God died. That understood things of God and lived out those things of God. They died. It died. And so I'm still a man. I'm still alive. And I still have my instincts. But I don't have what is necessary for me to define those instincts spiritually. I can't live them out spiritually on my own. So what does God do? Does he re-energize this dead spirit inside of you? No. He replaces a dead spirit with his spirit. So when I accept Jesus Christ into my heart and in my life, the Holy Spirit comes and lives in me and helps me to understand how to redefine myself and these instincts in a way that pleases God, in a way that glorifies God. Okay? Listen, if you thought this was bad, women... If you thought this was bad, how would you like it if your husband was no longer attracted to you physically? How would you like it if he just went monk on you? 
And it just said, you know, spiritually speaking, I just don't see that this is righteous anymore. So I'm just going to be like asexual. Would not be cool, would it? It wouldn't work. Yeah, that reality is absolutely critical for you as well as us. It's necessary, absolutely necessary. What has to happen, though, is it has to be defined by a spiritual quality. And what's happened to guys is because we've been ripped in half because of sin, all of the things that help us to define those instincts spiritually are dead in us. And so they have to come back to life. They have to resurrect in us. And the only way that can happen is through the Holy Spirit. Does this make sense to you? Hello? Have I lost everybody here? I hope not. This is really important because it's a trap. You see, lust becomes a trap when it is not connected to spiritual intimacy. Lust is so easy. It's instinctive. I mean, think about it. Do I need to take a lot of time to prove this? I hope I don't. I mean, the airbrushed fantasy that every guy in this room is familiar with, there's no need for communication. Right? There's no need for compromise. There's no need for creativity. There's no need for contribution. There's no need for anything. I, I have zero responsibility. I can just indulge myself physically and visually. That, that, and, and, that is just wrong, right? Right? But that is my instinct. Unless my instinct is defined by a spiritual reality, it's only an instinct. It's only a shell. You see, if I want to be what God wants me to be, I have got to let his spiritual reality define my instinct in this area. You know, when I was a kid, young guy, and I was trying to impress my girlfriend, I wanted to buy her some jewelry, in Indiana, I went to Service Merchandise, okay? That, there, was a, there was a place called Service Merchandise, and you could go in there, and they had all these cases, uh, uh, glass cases that you could look in and see all these little cheesy rings you could buy or necklaces or, you know, whatever. And, and, and I noticed that in there's this one case, and it's full of all these pretty pieces of jewelry, and they're really cheap, and they say 24-karat gold filled. Have you ever heard of that? 24-karat gold filled. And then this other case, and there were 10 carat and 14 carat gold. Now, to me, 24 carat is more valuable than 10 or 14 carat gold, right? I just didn't understand what the word filled means. Filled is just a nice way of saying spray painted, okay? Because I noticed that the stuff in this case was really, really cheap. And I could buy some really nice stuff in there. But this stuff over here, that was even less carrots than the other, they were really expensive. So when I was a kid, I said, well, sign me up over here. Right? I can impress the girls like crazy. I mean, this is really a great deal. Till I found out what that meant. And you see, I think that's the way it works with lust. It's like a shell. It's 24 karat gold filled. It's just the instinct without the purity, without the reality that goes with it, without that part of it that makes it so valuable and so priceless. These are the things that we need to understand. Now, you know what, guys, you're going, yeah, there he goes, picking on me. Gals, I just got back from Florida, and I was with my family, and I had a uh, a, a foundation meeting that I'm on the board of that I went to. And I'll tell you something. Women, you deal with lust too. I know you deal with lust in, in the direction of looking, but, I th- but, you, but you deal with lust primarily in another way. Men lust. Women want to be lusted after. I mean, I couldn't hardly sit by the pool because women were so desperate to be lusted after. You hear me? I mean, this is not a problem that's just a male problem, okay? It's a problem and a female problem. We both have instincts that, that proliferate the human race. But what we need to understand is there are dynamic spiritual qualities that define those instincts. 
And we can't get those inside of ourselves because they're dead. So we have to get them from the Holy Spirit, which means he's got to be inside of you. You have to have Jesus Christ as the Lord of your life, and you have to commit yourself to him so that he can put a bridle and control those instinctive behaviors so that they will bring glory to God. How do, what does this look like in the area of lust and intimacy? I'll tell you. First of all, guys, you have to know yourself and then you have to defend yourself. When you think about it, you have to know yourself and defend yourself. The Bible says in Ephesians 6 to put on the whole armor of God. All of that is designed for self-defense. You only have one weapon. That's the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Same thing that Jesus used when he was tempted of the devil. And he was tempted with lust, the lust of the flesh. For him it was eating. Because he'd gone 40 days without food. And he quoted scripture to the devil. You have to know yourself and defend yourself. That means you need to install defenses in your life. It means when your wife goes to bed, you go to bed. You don't stay up and see what's playing on the late shows. It means that you install that stuff on your computer. So one of those things pops up. It means that you put your computer screen where everybody can see it, not just you. Are you hearing me? It means that you let your wife see what's on your phone. I mean, I grew up in a time when if you wanted to look at porn, you had to go into the 7-Eleven, ask the lady, and look like a pervert. Pay the money. Isn't that way anymore? It's a touch of a button, two clicks away, and free all you want. And it plays off your instinct more than ever. We need to be men who defend ourselves and know ourselves so that we don't slip. Secondly, listen, here's the hard part, guys. If you want to be the godly man, you have to pursue intimacy with your spouse. Those of you that are married or planning on getting married, you need to understand intimacy is hard work. You have to talk. You really have to listen. You have to pray. That's what we were pushing in the last two weeks. You got to pray. You have to do life together. And it's not always exciting. It's not always airbrushed. You have to work through problems. You have to work with routine, the daily routine, which oftentimes can be boring. You have to deal with the life situations together. You got to mow the yard. You got to be patient when your wife is sick or when she has a headache for eight days in a row. You got to love your wife. Intimacy. This is different than the instinct. It's loving your wife like Christ loved the church. Because let me tell you, The church, the way I see it, makes me marvel at the love of Jesus Christ because we are one ugly broad. Amen? And he still loves us. And he'll do anything for us. And he has done everything for us. Man, we need to learn that. That's trap number one. Lust and intimacy. The instinct and the spiritual quality that defines it. Intimacy. Trap number two. Drive and generosity. You know, men are wired to take new territory. It's instinctive. We want to take that territory. And you know, that's not a bad thing. To be ambitious. I have heard that people have said ambition is wrong. I don't think ambition is wrong. I think ambition is a great thing. When you look at your child as you're raising up your child, don't you want them to be ambitious? Don't you want them to be at the head of their class? Don't you want them to be the best soccer player? Don't you want them to excel? Of course you do, and so do you. When we're ambitious, we use our God-given skills and abilities to help other people. We can help God's kingdom. It helps us to make a living. It helps our families, our customers, our country. But we have to define that instinct. And the spiritual quality that defines the instinct of drive is generosity. And if we are not generous, if we're not people who want to give ourselves away to help other people, what happens is that drive turns into greed and materialism. And you know what the devil can do? He can take a person who has all that drive that's been instilled by God and he can turn him into a man who only thinks about himself. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, this is what Paul tells Timothy. 
Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So this is the second big trap that John's talking about. In Ecclesiastes 5, the wisest man that ever lived, Solomon said this, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. Listen, it's okay to have money, but it's never okay to let money have you. And you see, that's what ends up happening. Men are supposed to put God first and then their families. But I have seen men, and maybe you've seen men, walk away from their families. Walk away from their responsibility to their kids and their wives and their extended family because they want to pursue more for themselves. I've seen people take a life that's going and working great, but they get an offer of making $20,000 more, uh, uh, $20, more a year, and they blow their whole life up just to make that move to get more money. They think, well, that's going to make it better for my family, but oftentimes it's just them stroking their own ego. I've seen a lot of men in counseling, a lot of married couples in counseling, and I've, I've heard women say, my husband, he just doesn't love me. And, and then I see the husband get offended. And the way he defends himself is by giving her a laundry list of all the things he's bought for her. Didn't I give you this? Didn't I give you that? Didn't I buy you that? Didn't I take you here? Didn't I? Don't you have this? And it's all materialism. And it's all greed. It's a misunderstanding. Real men use their God-given gifts to help their wives, their families, and other people in the kingdom of God, not just for themselves. Now, I'm going to show you a clip, uh, and this is a clip from an old sitcom called Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. How many of you have seen that before? Yeah, you remember that? That's where Will Smith got his start. And this is actually a very interesting clip. Um, some of you know what, how the sitcom sets up. Uh, he's leave, he lives with his Uncle Phil in Bel Air because his dad has abandoned him. And so he has to live with kind of a, a surrogate family. And um, his dad shows up in this scene, played by Ben Vereen. And uh, they were going to go on a trip together, and it was a huge deal uh, for Will Smith's character. And at the last minute, the father uh, backs out. Now, what makes this scene so interesting is that Will Smith goes off script. He goes completely off script. Now, uh, there's a lot of words that are bleeped out of this scene, okay? And they, they left them in in the original sitcom. But because what happened was Will Smith went completely off script and filled it all in himself. And the reason is because in real life, Will Smith was left by his father. And all of that came out in this scene. And of all the scenes in Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, this was the defining scene of the entire series. I want you to watch it. Are you going to tell Will or not? I'm not going to do your dirty work for you. Fine. Uh, I'll call him from the road. Yeah, then why don't you do that? Yeah, I'll do that. daddy out. What's up? Well, I'm glad you're here. Um, some business came up I got to handle. So we're going to have to put a, our trip on hold. You understand? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's, that's cool. That's cool. Just, just for a couple of weeks. Mm, I understand. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little longer. Yeah, whatever. Whatever. Look, I'll, I'll call you next week and we'll iron out the details. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah, yeah. It was great seeing you, son. You too, Lou. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I'm sorry, Will. <laughs> you know what? Actually, this works out better for me. You know, the Slimmies of summer come to class wearing next to nothing. You know what I'm saying? Will, it's all right to be angry. Hey, why should I be mad? So I'm saying, at least he said goodbye this time. I just wish I hadn't wasted my money buying this stupid present. 
I'm sorry. I, you know, if there was something that I Hey, could you know do. what? You ain't got to do no, nothing, Uncle Phil. Hey, you know, ain't like I'm still five years old, you know? Ain't like I'm going to be sitting up every night asking my mom, when's daddy coming home, you know? Who needs him? Hey, he wasn't there to teach me how to shoot my first basket, but I learned, didn't I? Hey, I got pretty good at it, too, didn't I, yeah, Uncle Phil? Did. Got through my first day without him, right? Mm -hmm. I learned how to drive. I learned how to shave. I learned how to fight without him. I had 14 great birthdays without him. He never even sent me a card to with him. I ain't need him then, and I don't need him now. Will. Will. Now, you know what, Uncle Phil? I'm going to get through college without him. I'm going to get a great job without him. I'm going to marry me a beautiful honey, and I'm going to have me a whole bunch of kids. I'm going to be a better father than he ever was. And I sure as I don't need him for that, because ain't a thing he could ever teach me about how to love my kids. How come he don't want me, man? Real men are committed. God put it in us and he wired us to take new territory, but he never wired us to blow off our commitments to take that new territory with new people. And our first commitment is to the Lord and to our families, our marriages, and our children. That's what God designed us to do and to be. So we have to take what he placed inside of us, that instinct we have, to go and take new territory, but it has to be defined by the spiritual quality of commitment. And if that's something that has to do with greed or self, what we have to do is we have to infuse that with the spiritual quality of generosity and show that love and that compassion and that commitment to those that God has put around us. Be committed to choose generosity. Do not leave God or your family behind for the sake of of money. Trap number three, pride and humility. There's nothing wrong with pride, and that's hard for me to say because pride is one of the things that takes me out, takes me down. But pride is instinctive, and it's actually a good thing. Just like drive is a good thing that God placed inside of you. Have you ever seen a person that has no pride in themselves? What does that look like? Have you seen a person who has no pride in where they live? who has no pride in the way they act or conduct themselves in their lives. Have you ever seen that before? That's not good, is it? We want to be around people who take pride in themselves. But it's humility that gives spiritual definition to pride. So if, we're gonna, if, if we have this pride inside of us that's instinctive, we have to have this spiritual quality of humility to help us to define it. You see, pride without humility says, I will do this myself. I don't need God. I'm going to be like God. Just like in the Old Testament when it talks about how the devil wanted to feel in his heart. But contrast that with Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was crucified. In Luke 22, what did he say? As he was sweating drops of blood, he said, Father, not my will but yours be done. And he submitted himself to torture and even to death. How strong of a man is that? You see, pride sometimes disguises itself as strength, but without humility, it really isn't. Here Jesus is strong. He's strong, but he's also humble. He, he takes something that none of us could have ever taken. He submitted himself to that. Listen, some of us don't want to submit to anybody. We want to be the one in charge. We want to be the one who's calling the shots. It's really not about whether or not we're going to submit because all of us will submit. It's who we're going to submit to. And if I'm going to submit to someone, I want to submit to someone who's stronger than me, someone who's better than me. Someone that I can respect. And if that isn't Jesus Christ, then who is it? I'll submit to him. I'll submit to Jesus. Because he is all of that. 
In week one, I shared with you a statistic that when a man comes to faith, His family follows him over 90% of the time. Do you remember that? But if only mom does, the number falls down to 17%. Which means, listen, the pride of a man keeps not only himself from God, but also his family. So you are either leading your family toward God, or you are leading them further away. Listen, I hope you learned something today. Guys especially, I hope you learned something. That these things that we have inside of us are not things that God ever intended for us to do away with. He never intended us to do away with our lust or our desire, our sexual drive. He just wanted us to define it spiritually. He never wanted us to do away with our drive and our desire to achieve. He just wanted us to define it spiritually. He never, ever wanted us to do away with pride. He just wanted it to be defined spiritually. And when we died spiritually because sin entered in our life, it killed us spiritually. It ripped us in half. And it took all of those things that enable us to spiritually define those instincts and took them away. And the only way we get them back is by being in relationship with Jesus Christ. And when we're in relationship with Jesus Christ, he takes us alongside himself and disciples us. He walks beside us and he teaches us how to deal with that lust and how to deal with that a desire for achievement and how to deal with that pride and to give the glory to him. And when we do that, we're starting to get a taste of what it was like before sin came in and wrecked everything. And here's the best part. The best part of, of this is amazing. Is that when God gets a hold of your life, he will complete what he starts. When God gets a hold of your life, you can have hope. Even though you fail, even though you fall, even though you trip and you mess up, God is going to finish what he starts. The scripture says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. And he will complete it. What we have to do is let him have that authority, that spiritual authority over our lives. We're moving to a time of decision.